be nice devotee, but he he too saw those millions of dollars as broken pieces of glass. <laughs> okay, next verse. Mm -hmm. Samsara Ramite Kona, Bagya Hadeke Hatara, Nadere Praha Yena Kasta Laga Tere. The conditioned souls are wandering throughout the different planets of the universe, entering various species of life. By good fortune, one of these souls may somehow or other be delivered from the ocean of Neshes, just as one of the many big logs in the flowing river. Now you may by chance reach the bank. Interesting analogy. Purport, there are unlimited conditioned souls who are bereft of Lord Krishna's service. Not knowing how to cross the ocean of nations, they are scattered by the waves of time and tide. However, some are fortunate to contact devotees. And by this contact, they are delivered from the ocean of nations. Just as a log floating down a river accidentally washes upon the bank. So the conditioned souls in the material universe is not just this universe or this planet are innumerable. The number cannot be written on paper. There is no such number. It's infinite. They say if you want to write a number that indicates infin infinity in numerical strength, you write one, seven, comma, and 15 zeros after it. If you write that number, one, seven, followed by 15 zeros, five sets of three, you get, you indicate infinity, infinity strength. So that number applies to the number of living entities in the material world. And they are wandering. Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Ki Jai. Samaveda Bhaktivinda Ki Jai. Shri Sri Radha Krishna. Gopi Gopina Shamakun Radhakun Giri Govardhan Ki Jai. We offer our respectful obeisances to all the great souls and to the Supreme Personality of Godhead in many of his prominent, prominent transcendental forms. So here we are hearing how that Kardanam Guna Sango Show, Sadasad Joni Janmasu. Living entities sometimes take birth in higher planets as demigods, sometimes on these middle planets as earthly beings, sometimes on these middle planetary systems below the earthly species of life, sometimes in lower planetary systems, moving from one material situation to another. And each time the living entity tries to overcome material energy by trying to become the controller and the enjoyer of material energy. But each life, one becomes defeated by the time element. And then one again to enters into the womb of another mother to again continue with this, what we say, useless struggle for happiness in a realm which is simply meant for suffering. Uh, until somehow one meets a bona fide spiritual master. Here was when one meets the bona fide spiritual master, his good fortune has manifested. And now to take advantage of that and engage in the devotional service of the Lord is, as we mentioned in the Chaitanya, I'm sorry, in the Bhakti Risavatu Sindhu by Srila Rupa Goswami, a most rare 
situation. To get that opportunity to meet a bona fide spiritual master, to get the opportunity for devotional service, to make progress in devotional service, to reach the goal of devotional service. It is very, each one of these categories are in the mood of rarity. And as Krishna says um, in the Bhagavad Gita, um, what is it? The seventh chapter, verse number three, he says, uh, many living entities try for perfection and, heart, and some who reach perfection uh, hardly know me in truth. Many engage in devotional service. Very few reach perfection and that of those who reach perfection, hardly one knows me in truth. So we see the rarity and the exclusiveness of devotional service because it is so great that devotional service is greater than Krishna. It's his internal energy manifested as Srimati Radharani. Therefore, we know that Krishna is fully controlled by Srimati Radharani. So one who, who uh, gauges fully in devotional service with a desire to please Krishna becomes gets complete shelter under the lotus feet of Srimati Radharani, who is so merciful, so compassionate, and yet so spiritually powerful that by her Shakti, she controls Krishna. And that means one has reached perfection in devotional service. So, but the point is that we have been in this material world for countless lifetimes, trying to somehow eke out some kind of happiness through the senses, through the mind, through the intelligence. And sometimes the little satisfaction is there. Sometimes one gets a good birth and goes to higher realms of existence. But then again, one has to fall from that situation and again, struggle in the material energy. This hard struggle is not meant for the soul. The soul is by nature blissful. The soul is by nature full of knowledge and the soul is eternal. A hard struggle for existence give, puts one in a situation where one thinks I die. But one thinks I have to work to try to get happiness. One thinks that I don't know so much, therefore I have to get more knowledge. So all of these things are superfluous and superficial and have nothing to do with the soul. The soul is by nature pure. The soul is in love with Krishna constantly. But the material mind and senses which are gifted to us, we might call it a gift, or granted to us because of our desires. We are in, in we're in a different consciousness, which is completely opposite of our nature. Therefore, if one comes in contact with a bona fide spiritual master, like this analogy here, when the, the logs are floating in the raging river, sometimes, just by chance, or nothing happens by chance, of course. Chance is a word that has no meaning, actually, because everything happens with a cause, but it appears to be chance. So we use that word in a very, you know, we say, undefinable way. Um, this, uh, this going away from the current of the river of material drifting, and taking shelter on the shore is taking shelter at the lotus feet of the bona fide spiritual master who will bring us to our eternal home in the spiritual world. So even if we don't make it in this life, still one should endeavor to make it in this life. And Srila Prabhupada said, don't wait for another life. Finish up your business in this life. Whatever, sometimes we get the idea, well, 
whatever I gain in devotional service is never lost. Therefore, I can pick up in my next life where I left off and make further progress. That is a true statement. But there's another point that we should consider, and that is whatever is holding one back from perfection in this life will again be an obstacle or something that we ought to overcome in our next life. We carry that same consciousness life after life. So if we have some material attachments now, when we're born, those same material attachments again will manifest when a particular situation arises in our life, which facilitates those desires. And we'll be face to face with our same material desires again. And therefore, in order to reach perfection, we have to overcome that or get rid of that. So Prabhupada would say, don't wait for another life, finish up in this life. And what that means, of course, we say that devotional service is very, to attain the kingdom of God in one birth is very rare, but it is possible. But the point is, perhaps, and this is actually not a perhaps, it is actually a, a foundational statement. And many of us who are performing devotional service now have performed devotional service in previous lives. Usually it says that in order to come to devotional service, one has to have had performed it in previous lives. But then that is generally true, but then we also say there is the principle of mercy, which has been given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. One comes to Krishna consciousness and one uh, sees the benefit and then one makes progress like that. So um, this, this idea of, of taking it easy in devotional service and just riding the waves of the material energy means going downstream. So one has to see what are my material desires? What is keeping me attached to this material world? And one has to know what is a material desire. An interaction with something material doesn't mean that I have a material desire for that object. Material desires means when I try to enjoy in that relationship or in that situation, that is a material, an expression of a material desire. We have to come in contact with the material energy, but our consciousness should be spiritual. And what is that spiritual consciousness? That everything belongs to Krishna. Manaso deho deho yokichu mor arpilu tu alpade nanda kishor. Srila Bhakti Vinoda prays, my home, my family, my body, my very existence, Nanda Kishore, Krishna, it belongs to you. It is meant for your service. So um, this is the consciousness of those who are in proper understanding that nothing in this world belongs to us. And to make a hard struggle to somehow rather find happiness through the senses, mind, and the intelligence diverts one's attention from one's real goal of life, which is devotional service to Krishna. And sometimes we can fulfill our material desires and we think, oh, let me continue in that direction. And then we see things change and that fulfillment can never be constant. Material energy works in such a way as to frustrate and ultimately, and of course, the ultimate principle of material life is that we have to leave whatever situation we have established. So the more, the less we establish, the easier it is to leave. <laughs>
So if we're trying to make a big, you know, kingdom in our material world, surrounded by aristocratic relatives, friends, and so many material opulences, thinking that that will give us some happiness and success. And then when that is no longer available, which is the time element, then to leave that is very painful. So, but one, when one doesn't have so much, it's not, it's not so easy, not so hard to leave it. So what we say is simple living, Krishna conscious thinking. Simple living means try to live according to your needs. Sometimes we live a little beyond that. That's not a, dis that's not a disqualification, but always take inventory. What are my attachments? How strong are they? Observe yourself, see. See where your consciousness is. How, many, how much time am I spending with Krishna? How much time am I spending trying to do so many other things in this world and therefore are not enough time for Krishna? What gives me pleasure? Is it devotional service or is it something material? So all these things to take, how much am I remembering Krishna throughout the day? How eager am I to enchant, enchant my rounds? How eager am I to read Srila Prabhupada's books? How eager am I to associate with devotees, especially those who are more advanced? We can, uh, we can see by taking a little bit of a introspective analysis of our consciousness to judge our own level of enthusiasm towards Krishna, as opposed to our enthusiasm for material activities. We shouldn't hate the things that we have to do in order to keep the body and mind together, the material activities. But at the same time, we should not try to enjoy it either. We do it simply because it's required. Okay, so this verse is, this shows the good fortune of the living entity. Um, as it says that devotional service is causeless, how one comes to devotional service cannot be understood. It's causeless, but there's no such thing as causelessness because causeless means something that one cannot find a cause for. But because one cannot find a cause for it, one doesn't mean there isn't any cause. Just like, um, you know, why does the sun rise over the eastern horizon instead of the western horizon? What, you know, what is the cause of that? Well, I can't see the cause. It's, then we say, well, it's causeless or it's chance or it's just happened. No, there's a reason why it's happening in that particular way. And there is a, there is a remote cause that is making it happen. And therefore in all activities, the remote cause is Krishna. And the immediate cause is what we can apparently uh, deduce by our own observation. So behind everything is Krishna. So when devotees come to Krishna consciousness, it's called causeless. But what is the cause? Krishna sends his pure devotee representative into the material world to rescue the foolish living entities who are trying to enjoy here. And because that living entity who has been deputed by Krishna to do the work, he's trying to give Krishna's mercy to others one becomes fortunate if they accept it. There's just like there was a there was a TV show many, many, many years ago. It was called The Millionaire. Now, our former president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, he was a TV actor. 
for a long time. And he was one of the stars of the show. This was back in the 1960s, I think. Maybe the early 70s, more like 60s. So this millionaire, you couldn't, you never saw this person. And all you heard was his voice. And so there's his voice and he calls his assistant who is Ronald Reagan. And he says, I wanna give a million dollars to this person here. So he writes a check, gives it to Ronald Reagan who is his carrier. And then he goes, finds the person, knocks on the door of somebody's house and says, here, uh, Mr. So-and-so wants to benedict you by giving you a million dollars. And he hands him the check. The person is shocked. They're not expecting it. They don't even know who he is, but they're so happy to receive it. And that's the uh, pretty much the, the essence of the, the show was this person is just benedicting everyone by giving them money and nobody knows who he is. Nobody sees him in the show. All they hear is his voice. And he just chooses his assistant to go. And he randomly picks, this is interesting. He randomly picks someone to give that benediction to. But his random choice is not random from his point of view. He chooses according to, he has a reason for choosing who he chooses. So Krishna, has a reason to want to save the living entities in the material world. And therefore he sends his pure representative. And that pure representative uh, comes and says, here, here's how you can fulfill all your desires perfectly, completely, eternally, and find complete satisfaction in doing that. And then if a person becomes intelligent, they say, oh, that is so nice. Thank you. I have been, my good fortune has come. Just like we say, we see that something inauspicious or something uh, unpleasant comes into our life. Apparently there's no reason for it. It's just coming. And we accept it because there's nothing else we can do. <laughs> It just happens. So in the same way that our good fortune will also come in that same way, if one has a particular desire, what is that desire? I want to understand what is the purpose of life? As soon as one asks that question, they start to open up their good fortune. What is the purpose of life? Does life have any purpose? Is it just eat, sleep, drink, be merry and die, and uh, in, in, engage in your senses till, you, till the body runs out? What is the purpose of life? And even great so-called great philosophers, I use the word so-called, uh, you know, Des, Desartes, Cart, Des, what is it? Cart Desartes. And uh, uh, what was his name? I uh, can't think of his name now. Uh, Camus. Yeah, all of these persons, they wrote books saying that life has no meaning. <laughs> life has no meaning. They say, whatever meaning you give to life, that is the meaning of life. <laughs> That's their philosophy. You choose your own meaning, and that meaning is your meaning for life for you. But there's no general meaning. It's whatever you want it to mean. And if you don't have any uh, choice, or sometimes you even change, well, the meaning of life is to get a good job. The meaning of life is to get a nice family. Or the meaning of life is to, is to enjoy the senses. So even people who don't know the meaning of life, they keep changing their own ideas of the meaning of life because what they adopt never is fulfilling. So they change into another one and another one and another one. 
But there is a meaning of life, and that is Taktwa Deham Porta Janma Naiti Mameti Surjana, to go back home, back to Godhead, and to attain our eternal position with Krishna in the spiritual world, which is our eternal constitutional position, unchangeable at any time, and, and it never changes, it's always the same. So devotional service is the means to attain it. It's devotional service is very rare. It's a great gift. Keep it as a great treasure. Just like sometimes we see if something is very valuable, not people put it in a very secure and very secret place, but so many locks around it and sometimes they even hire guards to guard it <laughs> uh, because they'll do anything to keep it so devotional service should should be executed in such a way that this is the most valuable thing in my life because it means back home back to godhead eternal life with krishna and devotional service and which fulfills all of our desires perfectly and completely. That is devotional service. It's the constitutional nature of the soul's existence. Not the body, but the soul. Okay, so I'll stop here. This is a very interesting section of this. And it gets even more interesting as time goes on. Maharaj. Thank you for the wonderful talk. It was really nice listening about different aspects of devotional service. Um, devotees, if you have any questions, comments, realizations, please unmute yourself and ask. And uh, uh, if you can't uh, speak, then you can maybe type in the chat box and I'll read it for you. Thank you, Hare Krishna. And yes, it'll be nice if you can keep your cameras on during the discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, become visible, manifest your existence in transcendental form unto the temporary video of the virile realm of existence. <laughs> okay, we have one more. Five out of 20, we're getting there slowly. Come on, Sri Devi, push your button. Any questions, comments? Rajprabhu, yes, you can go ahead. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Raj, you talked about uh, it's extremely, extremely rare for, first of all, it's extremely rare to even get a place on this earthly planet. And then it's extremely rare to get a human form, and then it's, it's even more extremely rare to come in contact with devotees and this path of uh, devotional service. But then it's still even extremely rare for someone there to actually cross the transcendental ocean. Uh, and you mentioned that there may be blocks or desires I wondered if you could explain a bit more about what is the secret for those people that make it across and what is what is it that is blocking so many of the rest of us in not achieving that in in this life and having to come back in maybe another or another another life well, I can explain one thing. Although the scriptures speak about that, we have what is called Tavayavatar, Sadhusita Mani, Kevalaya Nanda Kanda, Vajabhajabhai, Chaitanya Nitai. That in this age, 
that rarity has been reduced drastically by the mercy and the appearance of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Anayayanya Namo Maha Vandanaya Krishna Prema Padayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namadi Gauru Chastena Maha that rare, that ocean of devotion has been shrunk to the size of a puddle by the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's formula for cr crossing over that puddle is Sri Harinam Sankirtan. Krishna Varna Tusa Krishna Sangopanga Saparshidam Yajnai Sankirtanai Prayai Yajantihi Sumedasaha. This great ocean of material existence and the opposite shore is the eternal land of Krishna's existence is no longer an ocean anymore. It's just a small puddle. And Harinam Sankirtan is evaporating that ocean and making it smaller and smaller and smaller. The Mahaprabhu is given the formula. Chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> but chanting Hare Krishna is more than just chanting Hare Krishna. It's the process and it's part of the process simultaneously. So what is the process? to follow the instructions of the spiritual master. And the essence of the process is to glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the most topmost and most highly recommended and perfect means is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So if we accept that mercy as being supreme and make it prominent, in our Krishna consciousness, we will note that the, the mercy of Mahaprabhu is like an unflowing, it's pushing the logs of our material existence, which is floating down towards the, to the samsara of birth and death, off to the side onto the banks of the river, where no longer reaching the uh, or not reaching, but no longer existing within that un that unlimited river of samsara. The Mahaprabhu is very, very merciful. Here's where you need to put your attention. So the scriptures are giving us all of these rarity statements. The Mahaprabhu is actually defying the scriptures. <laughs> He's apparently even showing that the scriptures are just things that apply to other ages, not in this age. <laughs> Mahaprabhu's mercy. Harinam Sankirtan and Vaishnav Seva. He combines these two into one. These two make up the essence of Mahaprabhu's practice. Serve, serve and associate with Vaishnavas and chant the holy names of the Lord, Japa and Kirtan. As much, we say as much as possible, but that's not a fair statement because possible is our own, own decision. We say as much as is possible for me, but then it's always more possible because possible sometimes gives us a sense of limitation. We don't say as much as possible. We say more and more and more. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. So is it? It's Mahaprabhu. He is, he's making everything, what we say, easy <laughs> mm. and available. So what was difficult and rare has become easy and available. By Mahaprabhu. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. So I take it from that, then, that what we need to do is every day we need to try and increase the quantity, quality, and the intensity 
of our service, of our association, of all of the things in devotional service. The more we get into it, the taste develops. And then as the taste develops, the desire for increase becomes automatic. It's not something that you have to force. If you like something, just like we can't eat unlimitedly, say we like pizza. So sometimes we sit down to a big pizza and it covers the whole table and it's really huge. It's just the way we want it. It's, it's, it fits all of our expectations of what a pizza is supposed to be. And, uh, you know, I re, you know, like everything else stops and then we're just absorbing pizza. So we eat one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine big pieces, 10, 11. And after number 11, we're getting a little tipsy, you know. The tongue still says, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for more action. But the belly says, hey, you better hold up. I'm running out of room here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've, we've been in it. So there, the taste is there, but because it's material, there's a limitation on it. But that's not, that doesn't apply in Krishna consciousness. Once the taste develops, it can develop unlimitedly. We want that initial taste to kick jumpstart our, our uh, greater taste, which will come. And, uh, so those who are those who are the happiest in Krishna consciousness are doing two things: they're chanting the holy names, and they're engaged in service, and especially trying to serve Vaishnavas. Those are the those the devotees are really fixed in Krishna consciousness. They just want to serve. That's all. They've got a taste for service. And it becomes natural because devotional service is natural. It's the constitutional position of all living entities. So forget about the mind. The mind's always giving you reasons why you can't do it. <laughs> Just write down on a piece of paper all the reasons why um, I can fully engage in devotional service. And you may also write down the reasons why I'm not engaging in devotional service. And then once you get those reasons, then you can eliminate those. And we want to, yeah, so chant the holy names. Engage in devotional service and especially serving Vaishnavas. So we go to the temple because that's where the devotees are. We get an opportunity for chant for serving Vaishnavas when we go to the temple. We have a home, we can invite Vaishnavas to our house, have programs, chant the holy names, distribute prasadam, discuss transcendental subject matters. So you don't need to be in the temple. Turn your home into a temple. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Sukhava Mataji. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance as all glories to Shira Prabhupada and all glories to your lotus feet, Maharaj. Thank you so much for a very informative class. Uh, I think you've touched based on my question uh, with uh, Raj Prabhu's answer, but I, I still have one, one doubt or a question, whatever you think about, that how do we know that we are on the right path, Guru Maharaj? Because like just, we can't do everything. <laughs> okay, tell me, Guru, <laughs> please. Because the spiritual I'm... master is there to 
you check into the spiritual master. It's not like, okay, I got my initiation. I joined the club. I got a name. I got my card. And I put it up on the wall to remind me who I am. And that's it. See you later, guru. <laughs> <laughs> It's just yeah, keeps in my mind there all are, this time. There are devotees who don't need to contact the spiritual master because they're fixed in devotional service. And then when they do contact it, it's only a rarity for maybe for some celebration or some rare question. And then there's others who are more dependent on the association of the spiritual master. And then those, there's those who can't do anything unless they talk to the spiritual master and get confirmation in everything they do. So you have to see. It's like there's three animals. One is the fish, one is the tortoise, and one is the, uh, can't think of the third one. Monkey. I'll give you that example in tomorrow's class. Those three types of devotees compared to the three different uh, and uh, amphibious types of beings. And you can see the nature of these beings and how much they're either dependent or less dependent. But the spiritual master's duty is to teach you how to engage in devotional service where you can develop the understanding and therefore move forward. He's, so read the books, ask the questions, evaluate your different situations and see what's, up, what's holding you back, what are you attached to materially. But if you're happy, that's an indication you, you're going in the right direction. If you're unhappy, then something's wrong. Because the soul, the soul by nature is always happy. So there's, if you're engaged in devotional service, you're happy. <laughs> if you're properly engaged. Yeah. So uh, I know it, it, we are trying to. I wouldn't say that I'm fully into it, but I'm trying my level best to get engaged into the devotional service. Whatever, like listening to your class, we try and put it into the practice as well. Um, but still, like, I think when we are at work, I, I'm, when I'm at work, it does, it does become sometimes uh, stressful and get into the material thing a bit more, basically. And then I, then, yeah. like, uh, I don't know how to explain, but yeah, I feel I'm not in the right path then. No, you, we can discuss that. It's something that's a personal thing. So contact me separately and I have some ideas what I can suggest. Okay, thank you, Guru Thank you so but much. That, but, that, but that environment is just contrary to devotional service. There's no doubt about that. Hmm. And how strong you are will depend how much you are affected or not affected by that environment. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Okay. Krishna. Thank you. Sukhava. Remember your name. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. At least remembering. I, um, I, I can say that is my uh, some good karmas from the past or something I'm doing right that you are remembering me. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> yeah. Hare Krishna. Yeah. <laughs>
Thanks, Sukhava. Very sweet seeing you <laughs> after a long time. Uh, Shridhari <laughs> Mataji, you can ask a question. Thank you, Sadhya Brahma. My humble obeisances. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Prabhupada, all glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for another very illuminating lecture on this topic. I'm still thinking about that one sentence you said. The less we have established here, it's easier to leave. So how minimalistic we must become as time passes. I'm just thinking about <clears throat> the older generation that I knew growing up. They were so simple and they had so little. And I was thinking to myself, can I be like my grandmother and, you know, at, at that age and at that stage too? And I'm thinking, you know, that time for preparation is now. I can't wait, <laughs> you know, accumulating and gathering and, you know, seeing, you know, thinking I need this and I need that and holding stuff. And I mean, these tendencies are so contrary to letting go and detaching that I'm also concerned that even though we may take up more and more devotional service, what if I get too attached? Oh no, this project can do without me. I have to stick my fingers in it all the time. I have to be. Oh, there is, there is, uh, there's not, there's not, there's no, there's no such thing as too much devotional service. It's too much accumulating. It's like atyahara. Atyahara means collecting more than necessary and eating more than necessary, and that's one of the. Uh, one of the obstacles that, that destroys devotional service. It's called Atyahara, Rupa Goswami explains. Collecting more than necessary and eating more than necessary. So those two aspects. So if we eat more than necessary, we're gonna collect more than necessary. It kind of works in that direction. So try to keep your uh, material things to just what you need to keep body and soul together. In the material world, or even in the spiritual arena, there are two, two disqualifications in the, in the spiritual process. Too much wealth and too little. Those who are, can't even maintain themselves because they're poor, or those who are having too much they find it difficult to execute devotional service. Unless they're yogis living in the Himalayas and like that. But if we're living in, a, in the secular world and we can't even maintain ourselves because we don't have enough, that's a dis that makes devotional service very difficult. And if we have too much, then we're managing all of these things. And we're just trying to somehow or other keep them, protect them, and even use them. So uh, one, has, one has to be as simple as possible. Simplicity is one of the features of devotional service. Now, Grihastha life means to take on a little more responsibility in accumulating material things in order to keep the, uh, the home and the family uh, together. But then one should also be careful not to go in that direction and simply accumulate more. So if you're living in the society of devotees, then it's easy. If you're living away from the society of the devotees and you have to, um, you have to struggle to maintain yourself. And at the same time, you have to be aware not to go beyond your needs at the same time. Um, yes, Guru Maharaj, I do understand that. I'm no longer Grihastha now, I'm Vanaprastha, but still that Grihastha mentality of hoarding and accumulating, it's uh, definitely something I need to work on. I can see very clearly how attached I am even to, you know, a silly little rubber band, you know, and plastic bags, <laughs> like, as the way I was as a housewife, you know, or oh, collect all the plastic bags, somebody I will need it, collect all the rubber bands, somebody I will need it, and you have little collections of everything all of, and it's ridiculous, you know, I'm just thinking to myself, what am I doing? This is like just uh, holding and collecting again, you know, all over. 
Well, if you can use them, fine. If you can't, give them away. Right, right. Thank you. I, Thank I have my I have my bag bag of plastic bags too that I keep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank but every you. Time I, every time I need to pack something, I have I have I, I have them so I can use them for packing. <laughs> but I don't even have to pack or go anywhere. I just collect in case, you know. Uh -oh. Then you're in trouble. Need them. <laughs> yeah, you're in a you're in a you're in a difficult situation. You don't need all of it. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. I re I'm really grateful to you for this class. It's a big, uh, I, I, it shows me what all I need to work on. So thank you so much. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, we reached the uh, one hour mark. Well, thank you very much. And uh, this is such a powerful and very instructive and very, well, we say necessary uh, chapter in the Shaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, it would be nice um, as we go through these verses, go back over them and reread them and see, remember our discussions. Because this, for this chapter is the essence of Krishna consciousness. Okay, thank you very much.